Good evening. I'm Dr. Ron Smith, the president of the Southern Union in North America, a wonderful Christian church body and organization that embraces so many individuals unto a knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be virtually on this island of Bermuda. Really excited to interface through virtual medium uh, men and women on this great island. I just salute uh, Dr. Ken Manders, one of my dear friends who oversees this wonderful Christian enterprise on the island of Bermuda, to the church pastor and the pastors of this community, to all of our friends of the community, to members of the Church of the Living God. I am so honored to participate in sharing some wonderful prophetic messages for the next several nights, for the next two weeks, along the path of prophecy. If there was a theme that would be ascribed to my presentation from night to night, it would be labeled a system for survival in the 21st century. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the Bible's greatest end time signs. When we look around the world tonight, we see many people who are perplexed. People of all backgrounds and cultures are anxious. They're worried particularly in this COVID environment as they look toward the future. They wonder what's coming next. It's important to note from the very outset of my teaching from night to night that the book of Revelation clearly reveals God's plan for the future. You're going to hear me repeat this a few times. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. You will hear me say from not night to night, it's not what Ron Smith said, it's what he read. It's in the book. Take a look. If it's not in the word, it doesn't deserve to be heard. So the book of Revelation begins and ends with the glorious climax of the coming of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 declares, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him even they who pierced him. And the Bible declares all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. What's going on in this text? Revelation leads us to lift our eyes from the earth below to heaven above. It leads us to lift our eyes from the problems, the traumas, the COVID, the disappointments of life, the racial upheaval, the disappointments of this journey to the God who will send his son to solve this world's problems. It won't be solved down here, but there is a solution. Revelation 1, 7 states, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. So the last chapter of the book of Revelation confirms the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation twenty two twenty 20 says, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In Revelation 22, it says three times. I like this. I am coming quickly. You see, the book of Revelation beats with expectancy, with vibrancy, anticipating that soon all the promises of God are going to be fulfilled and Jesus will return. But you know, tonight, there's a question. How quickly is quickly? How soon is soon? And how near is near? In other words, haven't Christians down through the ages believed that his coming was near? Haven't the people of this wonderful island of Bermuda anticipated the coming of Jesus Christ and Bible teaching over and over again? Haven't they believed his coming was sooner than we could realize the question tonight really is, is there any evidence throughout the Bible that the coming of Jesus is near, that you and I might see the coming of Jesus personally? What signs might there be? Incidentally, we're not the first to ask that question. Jesus' disciples wondered what signs pointed to his coming. They came to Jesus and asked, Matthew 24, 3, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus outlines more than 20 signs of his return. In a masterful presentation, Jesus blended the events associated with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD with those that would take place 
at the end of the world. He gave signs, watch this, of his return. Signs of his return that would be occurring in the world of religion, in the world of politics, in the world of nature, in the world of society. The first of these signs, as I've mentioned thus far, is in the world of religion. What am I talking about? Jesus said before the end, there would be false Christs and false prophets. Matthew 24, 24 declares for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. Ladies and gentlemen, before the coming of Christ, we should expect an explosion of interest in religious leaders who are leading people from the word of God and leading them astray by false signs and miracles. Here's what I want to say. Merely because a miracle has been worked does not mean that the one who claims to have worked the miracle is from God. Did you know that? There could be another source behind the miracle. The Bible teaches that evil spirits can perform miracles. Revelation 16, 14 declares, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Ladies and gentlemen, these false teachers point to the miracles that they're doing as evidence that what they're saying is true. But I want to be clear. These signs will be demon-inspired to deceive men and women. They're counterfeits. The closer they get to the original, the more credible the counterfeit appears. I want to implore you tonight to beware of any religious teacher that leads you from the Bible. Beware! If anyone comes to you, even if they claim miraculous signs that they can heal the sick, and I know some sick people, people who are dying from diabetes, perhaps right on this island, people who are dying from cancer, people who are dying from all types of, of, of hematological and, and oncological disorders. If they disregard the plain teachings of the Bible, even if they claim to heal you, I would say beware. That's why every meeting that I preach from night to night, I want you to write down each text and look these things up in your Bible. That's why I precisely put these things on the screen that you're looking at so we can really understand and embrace and see it with our own eyes. We want you to see for yourself what we are sharing comes directly from the Word of God. And I want to make a covenant with you to not say anything on this Zoom platform that I cannot support. I want to be able to support it directly from the Word of God. And I invite you to study it out and see if this is so, and then follow God's leading in your life. Is that fair enough? False teachers leading religious cults and rising up around the world. I can go back in history just a little bit. In 1992, Shoko Asahara published a book declaring himself Christ. Japan's only fully enlightened master and also took the title unto himself, Lamb of God. Asahara claimed that he could transfer spiritual power to his followers, take away their sins, and also remove from them all bad karma. Well, three years after his book was published, his followers released a deadly gas in the Tokyo subway. I remember this. Killing 13 and injuring thousands. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last 50 years, there has been a rapid increase in those claiming to be divine spiritual leaders. On the continent of Africa, there are leaders who led their cult followers to a fiery death. The words of Jesus tell us to expect an explosion of interest in the occult world. In other words, in psychic phenomena. This is happening tonight, just as Jesus predicted over 2,000 years ago. Did you know that? Books on the occult are selling in the multi-millions. The number of books, magazines, movies, TV programs, as well as the internet sites on the occult is exploding today. At least where I live, and I know it's exploding here, even on this island. People are turning to psychic seers. They're turning to occult artists. The signs Jesus gave in the realm of religion, ladies and gentlemen, are being fulfilled before our very eyes tonight. These false Christs and false prophets are a sign of the last days. 
Well, then the Savior then moves to the area of politics. He discusses international conflict war. Jesus predicts the very events we see occurring around us tonight. Matthew 24, 6 says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Ladies and gentlemen, haven't we always had wars down through history? And if we've had conflict throughout centuries, what sense would it make tonight to say that war is a sign of the end of the world? Let's notice carefully what Jesus really is saying. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Wars is in the plural. Matthew 24, 7 says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And Jesus predicted just before the end, there would be international conflicts on a global scale. In other words, there would be world wars. Having launched into the 21st century, we look back on the 20th century as the bloodiest of all. As a matter of fact, one sociologist estimated in the 20th century, that's the last century before this one, there were 180 million deaths from war alone. The 20th and 21st centuries have been engulfed in the flames of war, the 21st century war, the Second Congo War, the war on terrorism, the Darfur conflict, the Israeli-Lebanese conflict, the Russia-Georgia conflict, the Baluchstan War, the Burundi Civil War, the Ivory Coast Civil War, the Ethiopia-Somalia War, the India-Bangladesh Conflict, Yemen Civil War, the Ukraine Civil War, the Gaza War, the ISIS insurgency. Think, ladies and gentlemen, about the devastation in Sudan as war continues to rage on and on and on. And what about the uncertainty in so many of the African nations and the devastation that was taking place years ago that touched my heart in Libya? Of course, the Middle East remains a hot spot of conflict. Iraq and Syria have been devastated by war, and so many other Middle Eastern countries have been ravaged by war. Jesus' words are being rapidly fulfilled. The war in Afghanistan, territorial disputes in South, in South Africa, the China Sea, tensions in the China Sea, the east side, the North Korean crisis, confrontation between the United States and Iran, civil war in Syria, political instability in Lebanon, instability in Egypt, conflict in Ukraine, Conflict between Turkey and armed Kurdish groups. Criminal violence in Mexico. Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Boko Haram in Nigeria. The conflict between India and Pakistan. Instability in Venezuela. World peace, I want to emphasize tonight, is extremely fragile. The Bible predicts that all human attempts to achieve world peace are going to fail. The Apostle Paul describes it this way. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, particularly 5, 3 says, But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and they shall not escape. You know, ladies and gentlemen, a classic example of a peace treaty I remember was that supposed end of a war that took place. I remember the Treaty of Versailles in June 28, 1919, leading to the League of Nations. Of course, it wasn't long until the worst world war in history, World War II, broke out. And this led to the formation of the United Nations in 1945. Here's the point I'm trying to make. For all of its best efforts, my country, the United States of America, has failed to achieve world peace. War has continued to engulf the planet. The Bible says, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And we are seeing these prophecies being fulfilled before our very eyes tonight. I really want you to appreciate this reality tonight. The Bible is so accurate. It speaks of our day. I'm talking about 2021. The Bible says that Jesus would come at a time when the human race has the potential, hear me, the potential for world destruction. Never before in history has the human race had the ability or the capacity to destroy itself. Revelation describes it this way. Revelation 11:18. the nations were angry. And your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants and the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So when Jesus comes to give out his reward, I want to be clear, according to Bible teaching, 
He comes at a time when the human race has the capacity to destroy the earth. Well, let me ask you. Think carefully as I ask this question tonight. Did the human race have the capacity to destroy the earth 100 years ago? I'll answer it for you. Certainly not. But tonight, we have nuclear weaponry enough to destroy the earth multiple times over. There, listen to this. This is going to frighten you to some, to some degree. There have never been weapons made that have not been used. Jesus said that when the world would be gripped with fear, he would step across the threshold of eternity into time. He will come to deliver us. Luke 21, 26 says, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are fearful, don't look around you. The Bible is clear. Look up for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. I don't know about you, when I see stuff going on on Capitol Hill in the United States of America, when I see stuff going down on the national landscape of conflict between nations, I think I can hear the footsteps of the coming of Jesus. All of history is moving to a grand climax. Jesus said, lift up your eyes off the earth and focus them on divine reality. I am about to return. The book of Revelation and the entire Bible reveals a truth tonight, and that truth is simple and succinct. In spite of all the hell that's breaking loose in this world, here's what I want you to catch. There is hope. There are signs in the world of religion, but then there are signs in the world of politics and signs in the world of nature. The Bible predicts that all nature will be out of control just before the coming of Jesus. In other words... We should expect tornadoes, fires, floods, hurricanes, and an epidemic of destruction that we can hardly imagine. Among these natural disasters is the Bible's prediction for a worldwide hunger and famine. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, according to Matthew 24, 7. Well, let me ask you again. Haven't we always had famines? Haven't there always been hungry children? We've always had famines. They've always been hungry children down through the ages. But there's a difference here, folk. Jesus didn't predict a famine, but he said there would be famines, plural famines, on an international scale, hunger on an unprecedented scale just before the coming of Jesus. And you know what? As we look out over our world, as we look over this beautiful island of Bermuda, indeed, I've discovered these prophecies as others are being fulfilled. The United Nations reported recently that there's a severe food shortage in 38 of the major countries of this world. One-sixth, as you're listening to this sermon, one-sixth of the world's population will go hungry tonight. It's staggering when you look at the immensity of world famine. Experts estimate that for 2 billion people in the world right now or more, nearly one-third of the world's population, chronic hunger is an ever-present part of daily life. Jesus' prediction regarding famine is coming true with uncanny accuracy. 10,000 people per day, 3.5 million per year die of starvation. There are more and more people to feed and less and less food to feed them. Drought in the Horn of Africa in 2011 resulted in the death of tens of thousands. Half the population of Somalia was affected by the famine. An estimated 260,000 people, that's half of them under the age of six, they died. Then he said there would be pestilences. Uh-oh, watch this. Matthew 24, 7 says, there will be pestilences, famines, pestilences. Somebody asks, what's a pestilence? A pestilence is a strange disease which afflicts human beings, crops, and the environment. They can result, watch this, from natural causes, or they can be triggered from the carelessness of human beings. Matthew 24 says, there will be famines, there will be pestilences, and this prophecy is being rapidly fulfilled. You've heard of pesticides, haven't you, on crops? 
The reason farmers put pesticides on crops is because these diseases are destroying them. Pestilences are rapidly spreading in various parts of the world. Every year, there are more than 1 billion cases and over 1 million deaths from vector-borne diseases, pestilences in other words, such as dengue, cystoscomiasis, human African diseases and Chagos disease and yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis and, and all types of diseases globally according to the World Health Organization of 2016. Recently, 104 Nobel Prize winning scientists plus more than 1,500 prominent international scientists signed a document entitled Warning to Humanity. They declared no more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the new threats that we now confront will be lost and the prospects of humanity immeasurably diminished. It sounds to me like we're talking about COVID-19. Jesus said also there would be earthquakes. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. It is estimated that the world currently experiences approximately 50 earthquakes per day or nearly 20,000 a year. Since the turn of the new millennium, it's estimated that there have been over 800,000 deaths from earthquakes and related tsunamis. Jesus continues in Luke 21. He says there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. This upheaval in nature would, re would reveal itself in various ways, again, through hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, floods, fires. They would manifest themselves in rapid succession. In my union, where I currently lead, in the territory of the world where I live, near Orlando, Florida, and South Florida, and Central Florida, it is just a, it is just a thoroughfare for tornadoes and hurricanes. And it's commonplace. The news that we listen to every day is full of disasters affecting millions. In just the years since the beginning of this century evolved, there have been countless thousands more killed, injured, displaced, or financially disrupted by fires, floods, heat waves, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, or drought. And ladies and gentlemen, these natural disasters are signs, I need you to get this, these are signs of the return of our Lord. In other words, all of earth is crying out, oh Jesus, come quickly. Hearts are indeed failing for fear and for expectations of those things that are coming on the earth. We've seen an increase in the signs that Jesus foretold all around us. When you look at our world tonight, it does seem that all of nature is out of control. But those of us who have confidence in the Bible believe that these are signposts on the way pointing to Jesus' soon coming. We've seen what the Bible says regarding the signs of Christ's coming in the world of religion, in the world of politics, in the world of nature. Now let's look at his predictions regarding the social life around us. Our Lord predicted the moral fabric of society would fall apart just before the return of Jesus. Moral decay and corruption would be prevalent everywhere. Matthew 24, 37 and 38 says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. You know, many are familiar with the story of Noah's ark full of animals that escaped the flood waters that destroyed the earth. But what, but what was society really like in Noah's day, before the flood. What was it like? Jesus gives a glimpse as he continues. He says, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What's wrong with eating? What's wrong with drinking? I love to eat and drink the right stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with marrying and giving in marriage? Nothing. This passage describes a people who continued living self-centered, godless lives. They took their eating and drinking to excess. In other words, pleasure dominated their lives, and they ignored the signs of the times. Noah proclaimed, a flood is coming. Noah pointed out the decay of morality. He indicated that a flood was coming, and yet people of his day, 
continued to live their self-centered lives. They were not spiritually moved. They did not repent of their sins. Their minds were too occupied. They were enchanted with the here and the now. Eternity was crowded out of their thinking. What about tonight? Jesus predicted that there would be loose morality at the end of time, just like it was in the days of Noah. When Jesus uses the phrase marrying and giving in marriage, he was predicting, watch this, the breakup of the family unit and a complacent attitude towards spiritual things and moral living. Do we see that happening tonight? You know, the biblical model for family has been shattered in modern society. We have so many alternatives surrounding what a family should look like. There is so much confusion surrounding sexual preference. There's divorce. There's separation. There are failed relationships that affect millions of homes every year. Children from fatherless homes are especially vulnerable to suicide, criminal behavior, drug addictions, behavioral disorders, being rape victims or rapists, teenage pregnancy at a higher risk of going to prison later in life. We can thank God that whatever circumstances you might find yourself in tonight, even if you're one of those statistics we've just looked at just now, any of those are statistics, God can heal your heart. God can give you a new sense of his love and care. He'll put his arms around you. He offers you a new future. Whatever mistakes you may have made, God can forgive you and give you a new start. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters not how badly you've messed up. When mother forsakes you, when father turns his back on you, when society declares that you aren't worth a dime, that's when Jesus steps up to the plate and he says, I'll still accept you. Come to me if you're a liar. Come if you're an adulterer. I've got a plan for your life. Did you know that we also live in a world of rising crime and violence similar to Noah's day? Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 state it this way. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. That's the Bible. In Noah's day, God destroyed the world with a flood because it was filled with violence. You need to get that. Is our earth filled with violence tonight? Well, maybe not on this beautiful island of Bermuda, but it's every place else in the world. Is it a global concern? Are world governments concerned about violence? Yes, governments are concerned. In as recent as the year 2014, the World Health Organization reported a shocking summary of the problems of global violence and the efforts to address them. 475,000 homicide deaths per year. One in four children has been physically abused. One in three women has been a victim of abuse. And one in 17 elderly persons has been abused in the past month. The Bible also predicts economic uncertainty as a sign of the last days. James 5 verses 1 through 3 describes it this way. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. And your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Revelation 18, 17 says, For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Wars have caused millions to flee their homes and become destitute people living in refugee camps. Stock markets have crashed. Earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, typhoons, floods, fires, tornadoes have destroyed homes, businesses causing tens of millions of people to struggle to survive on very, very little. What's the point I'm trying to make tonight? Here's the point. Jesus is coming. And these prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Signs are being fulfilled. False Christs and prophets, wars and rumors of wars, cries of peace but no peace, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, sexual immorality, homes falling apart, violence filling our lands, economic uncertainty, all these signs, listen to me, are fulfilled. But there is one more sign which will prove beyond the shadow of a doubt 
that indeed we are living in the very last days of this world's history. The final sign that Jesus gives of his soon return in Matthew 24 is the gospel being proclaimed to the entire world. That's why I'm on this island of Bermuda now, preaching the everlasting gospel to people who quest to find Jesus. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Revelation 14, 6 also echoes this thought. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In Revelation, Jesus says, you're going to know we've come to the end by the final sign. What's that final sign? When you see the gospel going quickly around the world. This prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled tonight. The gospel is moving. Oh yes, I'm in a studio of my office here that's set up. But I'm also in Bermuda tonight. Isn't that amazing in this day and age? Tonight, the gospel leaps across all barriers through radio, through television, through the internet. How many of you have a cell phone? How many people can receive text messages and biblical presentations right on their cell phones tonight through multiple media platforms? Facebook, YouTube. God is reaching people in every possible way. You know, in a mountain village of Southeast Asia, a remote tribe received a transistor radio. They began listening years ago before the technology really evolved, listening to a shortwave signal of a, of a program called Adventist World Radio. That's a Christian radio network broadcasting truth-filled gospel presentations. And as they listened to the Word of God, the whole village was transformed by God's grace, and they became Christians. I remember reading about a Middle Eastern home. A Muslim family began watching Christian television. Their lives were changed and they too are now committed to walking with Jesus. In a Siberian prison, a hardened criminal heard the message of Christ through a satellite transmission and is now a consecrated believer. In a crowded European city, a desperate young man picked up a brochure advertising a series of meetings just like this, just like the one that you're listening to tonight. And new hope flooded into his heart and his life was changed. From remote villages, to barren deserts, to wealthy homes, in gated communities, prisons, and the cities with their teeming masses, the gospel is going forth in these last days in some remarkable ways. I mean, it's amazing. God is working miracles around the world tonight. Just as I'm preaching, do you know that millions are being stirred as never before with the sense of urgency of the times? Millions are turning from the uncertainty of this world to seek for a better world to come. Many have sacrificed all to take the gospel to the far regions of the world. God is on the move. Prophecy is being fulfilled around the world. Did you know that God is doing a new thing? God is doing something special. He's fulfilling his word. Be clear that we're on the very verge of the kingdom of God. The signs that our Lord gave are being fulfilled. I want you to know, folk, you, unless you're daydreaming, it's the midnight hour. And God is appealing tonight to men and women. He's appealing to you right now. He's appealing to me. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready for my return. God is doing something unusual. Again, thousands are being baptized into Jesus Christ. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move in the form of communist lands. God is working miracles. The Berlin Wall has crumbled. The Iron Curtain has come down. Totalitarian regimes are no more. In Romania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland, Russia. God is doing some, some amazing, amazing things. A spiritual revival is taking place in most of the countries of Africa. I've traveled there, folks. It is a vast place to evangelize. God 
is doing something unusual. Again, thousands are being baptized into Jesus Christ. President Manders and I had the privilege of being over in Africa and just watching God move in miraculous ways. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move. In the former communist lands, God is working miracles. The Berlin Wall has crumbled. The Iron Curtain has come down. Totalitarian regimes are no more. In Romania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland, Russia, God is doing some amazing stuff, ladies and gentlemen. The gospel is going forward in power. And tens of thousands are responding to God's final call. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God is on the move. What about the Hindu lands? Come with me for a moment to India. Here's a country that has resisted the preaching of the gospel. Every and all kinds of missionaries, early Christian people, they worked for decades, watch this, for just one convert. But did you know that India is open to the gospel tonight? What am I talking about? Even in India, where there was one convert after a very long time, now thousands are coming to Christ and are being baptized. Former Hindus are becoming Christians. In one section of northern India, over 100,000 people accepted Christ just recently. In every village, the people are begging for someone to tell them about Jesus. What am I trying to say? God is on the move. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Around the world, God is doing something special. He's doing something amazing. He is fulfilling his word, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to come with me now to the prosperous United States. Even here, God is on the move. Oh, I just love the system for survival opportunities. We see so many young people and adult people and middle-aged people and senior citizens coming to Jesus Christ. Oh, I had a wonderful time in Miami, Florida. Watch as young people by the hundreds are coming to Jesus. Older people are coming and giving their hearts to the Lord by the hundreds. Families and people from all over the world are coming. Oh, I just love a system for survival campaigns because God is on the move. I wonder tonight, would you like to just in your heart figuratively say, yes, Jesus, I believe you are coming soon. How many of you would like to say in your hearts, Lord, I want to be ready for your coming. Let me ask you, is there anything in your life that would keep you from being ready for Christ is coming. I wonder would you just bow your head right now and surrender that thing to Jesus Christ. Somebody asks, how soon? I can't tell you how soon he's coming in terms of years or months. But this I know. With the ascendancy of atheistic philosophy, with the upheaval of crime and contention, it must be that soon Jesus Christ is going to come. How soon? I can't tell you in terms of weeks or days, but I can say in the words of the Apostle Paul, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. How soon? I can't tell you in terms of moments or seconds, but I can tell you this in the words of Andre Crouch, soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah. Will you pray with me now as I ask God to enshroud you and support you as we surrender our lives and whatever things we have in life that barricade or quarantine or stymie our progress to Jesus Christ. I want to surrender that thing and I want you to surrender that thing to Jesus right now as we pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are tonight for the blessing of knowing you, even right now, Lord, on this wonderful island of Bermuda. We look to you, and we come to you laden with challenges in our health. Oh, Lord, there are all types of diagnoses. I don't know what they are. I don't know if it's diabetes. I don't know if it's elevated cholesterol. I don't know if it's cancer. I don't know if it's high blood pressure. But, Lord, what I know is 
You fixed all malady. You, you're known as Rapha, the God who heals. Oh, you're Jehovah Rapha. Thank you, Lord, for what you do for healing. You heal demoniacs. You heal people with issues of blood. You heal people sitting by the pool of Bethesda. You heal a man sitting by the gate called Beautiful. Lord, you even raised Jairus' daughter. Lord, I know you can fix sickle cell anemia. I know you can fix Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. I know, oh God, you can fix Alzheimer's and dementia disorders. Lord, you've healed all types of individuals with all types of maladies. You can see about somebody tonight who's tuned in. And secondly, Lord, we're praying about somebody's business and finance. Lord, just open up some windows and perform something that will just make people convinced, feel convinced that you are in the providing business, the rearranging business. Help us to reset and recalibrate our business in a way where we can survive simply by being partners with you. And then, Lord, I'm praying tonight for families. I'm praying for people who are struggling, people who are hurting in relationships, whether it's in the home front, relationships on the job, in the community, on the playground, wherever they exist. I pray, oh God, that you will heal people's communication, rebuild their intimacy and their trust, and fix relationships once more where we can find our homeostasis in love between husband and wife, between father and son between mother and daughter, between subordinate and superior in the workplace, between colleagues, between members of a church, between pastor and members, between members and pastor. Oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus tonight that you would fix relationships. And then Father, finally I pray as I always do in every prayer that you will address those hard to break habits. I call them strongholds. Those things that grip us, those things that stymie us, those hard to break habits, those monkeys on our backs that we can't shake off like addictions and relationships that are not authorized. Oh God, my prayer tonight is that you will break every chain, set us free, empower us to be the best we can be. And Lord, en route to the impending nearness when Jesus Christ will return to this world, we decide to surrender everything because we don't want to be lost. Lord, please take us home. Get us out of this mess. COVID is destroying our country. It's destroying our world. It's destroying our family. Oh God, in the name of Jesus tonight, fix it up for us, Lord. Redeem us, not just with a vaccine, but extract this plague from our dwelling. Oh God, we give our lives to you tonight anew. We want to be saved in your kingdom. We want to be ready. We don't want to just get ready. We want to be ready when Jesus comes. And in order to accomplish that, it requires us making a total surrender to you tonight. That we do by faith. And we lift our hands right now, even on this, on this platform of social media. We raise our hands and we say, Lord, all to you. I surrender. I take my stand in my heart with you tonight, oh God. Yes, I recognize that I've got a bad track record. But Lord, you don't care about that. You love us. You just want to meet us where we are. And I ask that you would receive us, embrace us, rehabilitate us, stabilize us, fix somebody's home, fix somebody's life, and empower us to be the best we can be. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you on tomorrow night.